So welcome to our lecture number 13. As I was just saying, we are gonna finish today the section on ductile deformation. So today we have a topic which you can see it's titled here called shear zones. Now, shear zones, we could have a, a, a whole course uh, only on shear zones. They are extremely complex. Uh, so um, then what can we cover? I decided to give you an introduction to shear zones a bit. Um, and those of you who are interested, you can always uh, read more, but I don't want to throw it to you too much uh, for the test. Yeah. So that's why we are going to have a look at some photographies and a bit of um, a few diagrams, and then this is it. All right. So here you see a photography. You see uh, two persons uh, scale here. This comes from Spain, I see. And basically, what they are trying to uh, show here is a shear zone, which is this zone that you see here. And they say it's um, uh, obviously they say it's a uh, spectacular. Now we see it in black and white, so may not seem that spectacular. But look at this. Basically, they they draw our attention to this um, uh, rock body, which is a pegmatite. Now. A pegmatite body is imagine um, imagine something of granitic composition having large crystals of feldspar and quartz. So and they are typically they are white, yeah. So that's why they are uh, lighter color in the, this black and white photograph. So you see, it, it seems to you that it was entrained, yeah. It was uh, entrained in this. Um, and dragged in this shear zone and deformed. Yeah, so it looks as if the rock flowed, obviously. So uh, the shear zone that we we uh, we can now see it here um, shows you distributed deformation. Yeah, distributed deformation, and it appears to be like a ductile shear zone. Now in this class, I will again, as we started this part of the course, discussing about what is brittle, what is ductile, and the confusion because ductile to our eyes, it seems that there was no loss of cohesion, but microscopically we have two situations. We can have brittle processes and we can have ductile, so um, plastic processes, so, sorry. So in this case, uh, when you say ductile shear zone, uh, you can kind of wonder what kind of processes yeah? are, are they plastic if they are plastic most of the people when they say ductile shear zones they refer to this they they want to convey the idea that probably you have plastic deformation but it's not very correct yeah that's the idea anyway let's uh, have a look at the this is a picture from the textbook yeah so the the author of the textbook is from Norway so he has examples from Norway which is good enough uh, good geology in Norway. So again, he uh, took a photograph. You see, it's a 40 centimeter. So in the previous picture, we were looking at something across uh, meters. Now we look at across centimeters. So a 40 centimeter section of a of a shear zone. Yeah, and you can see um, it is in Proterozoic Proterozoic age. Uh, that means more than 570 million years ago, but it could be uh, down to 2.5 billion years. But also it was a very long era. So um, here you can see basically, you can see these small folds, yeah? So the shear zone, the deformation, which occurred in, the, in this zone, yeah? So it's distributed. But you can feel the sense of shear. Yeah, these folds were formed. So it's a it's a dextral, if you want, dextral shear zone. Yeah, top to the right. Um, now, um, as we discussed about folds, yeah, we discussed about this. You know that the strain tends to be localized. Now, how localized is it? Yeah, and that's that's the idea we discussed about folds and uh, you might think about all shear fractures about one plane where the deformation occurs 
or it occurs into a zone or a band, yeah? The formation bands, like in uh, poorly consolidated sandstones, we discussed about that, those. So if we are in the brittle regime, we call this strain localization structures, we call them shear fractures or faults. Yeah, so we discussed this. Now, in the plastic regime, in the plastic regime, uh, let's say you were to put a marker, like you, you, you have a colored marker and you draw on the rock and then you wait some millions of years for the rock to deform. <laughs> and then you look, look at the marker and it seems to you that the marker did not lose Cohesion, yeah, it's continuous. It shows continuity. So this is a classic type of shear zone, but it is an end member. We have a spectrum, yeah. We start from shear fractures and faults to, you know, plastic shear zones. So we have this spectrum, yeah, where the formation is localized. Now, in the case of these classic shear zones, yeah, where people think about plastic mechanisms, uh, they, they can be many kilometers wide, yeah. but also they can be very small, like centimeters. So I'll, we are looking now at something, you know, across the width of centimeters. But some of these big shear zones, crustal scale, could be kilometers in width. And I'll give you an example. The cores of the continents, uh, we call them cratons, yeah, and the exposed part of the cratons, we call them shields, uh, like the Canadian shield, yeah. Uh, here in, in South America, we have the Amazonian craton, and part of it is exposed in the Guyana shield. Now, the part that is not exposed of the Guyana shield and extends, extends uh, as the basement to sediment layers that are in the Janos Orientalis across from, uh, from Bogota, if we cross the mountains. And if we drill, we are gonna uh, hit the, yes? May I ask yes, a question? David. Yes, David. Why, um, if cratons ha uh, are made up of uh, the primary rocks uh, since the earth was, was um, formed? Was, yeah. So um, why they, as I imagine, they, their density must be high. Why they do not uh, get emerged into the into the tectonic plates? No, but they are part of the tectonic plates. We'll discuss into, this. Uh, uh, under, sorry, under. But their density is not high. This is a typical continental crust. I mean, uh, uh, their density, because they are uh, mostly of a composition which is kind of like the granite diorite, especially the upper part. They have uh, um, they have uh, rocks that are less dense, like granites and uh, uh, granite diorites and tonalites. Of course, they have some dense rocks, but they are the typical example of continental uh, crust. And uh, and if they are old, that, that doesn't mean that they need to be dense. Yeah, like the oceanic crust is denser, yeah? And that's a matter of composition. Um, the fact is, and this is, uh, I, th I think that it's good that you asked this question, David, and you know why? Because we in geology, we are trying to impart a geological education to you, and you will do it for uh, those in the generations that come after you, um, uh, so the younger generations of the future. So what we try to impart is not only a vision of the particular processes that we look at, we say, well, this is structural geology, this is petrology, and so on. We are trying to, in the end, philosophically speaking, <laughs> yes, Gabriel, um, understand the dynamics of the earth as a whole, yeah? And over the long period of time, this is the most interesting thing, that the formation of the continental crust and its growth uh, over time reflects a um, uh, secular evolution of our planet, which is a chemical differentiation, yeah? So the formation of the crust is a chemical dif differentiation process. So the outer shell, the continents, are the less, least dense part, yeah? <laughs> least dense part of the earth. And so the, imagine as if you, you have an initial composition and 
then it is this uh, separation into layers. Yeah, so we are witnessing uh, in geologic time this uh, growth of continental crust through addition of orogenic belts to pre-existing pre-existing pre um, continental masses. And that's why I said the cores of the continents, yeah? So they are basically the uh, nuclei uh, of the continents are these cratons, yeah? Because they are the oldest part. And then newer continental crust was formed through uh, orogeny, through the addition of material uh to the continents and that's why what we will discuss actually you david through your question you are um, jumping a bit into the second part of the course because as i said it's more interesting because i want to give you a, a better vision of the of the earth yeah so i think that in your question the only premise which was incorrect is that they are not more dense than the environment the 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 cratons yeah so um, all right, so uh, where was I? So the idea is, uh, I wanted to, to tell you about a bit the cratons, is that in these cratons, uh, some of you will go and work because they are very rich in, uh, you know, mineral endowment. And because they are rich, uh, people do exploration. And there is a certain type of gold deposits that we call them orogenic gold deposits and they uh, basically are related to uh, some solutions yeah uh, you must have a solution that transports the elements in this case the gold for instance from a source to the place of deposition and this hydrothermal that's why how we call them hydrothermal fluids come from metamorphism so these are the fluids that form as a result of regional metamorphism in the course of the or origins. And now because the cratons exposed due to erosion, expose the deeper level, some deeper levels of the crust, um, we can access these orogenic gold deposits. And it's a big endowment. Yeah, endowment means inheritance. Yeah, that of uh, gold. And these gold deposits are associated with uh, major crustal scale shear zones. Uh, um, not necessarily on the main shear zone structure, they can be associated with secondary structures linked to this big shear zone, which is crustal scale, and along which there was circulation, yeah, circulation of these metamorphic fluids that transported the elements. It is very interesting, actually. And what I will do at the end of this course, we have a little section on Precambrian geology, because Precambrian geology is not really taught in many uh, geoscience departments. Not yet. I am one of the promoters of those who want to bring more of Course, more courses dedicated to Precambrian geology. And I will give you the, the reason for this. The Precambrian time, what we call Precambrian, uh, is from the formation of the earth until 570 million years ago. But our earth has an age of 4 billion and 500 million. So if you were to, to do, uh, you know, the division of the time into nine parts, you, you know, <laughs> we have the Phanerozoic, only one of these nine parts, and the other eight are the Precambrian. So the, most of the geological evolution of the Earth and uh, most of what we inherit today was formed then, and we inherit this today. So I think that our understanding of the Precambrian should be deeper, and especially considering that there are differences between the Precambrian geology and the Phanerozoic geology. So this is why slowly, and uh, you know, when I have the opportunity, I like talking a bit about this because I, I'm pretty sure that you will 
at least some of you will have a good chance to to go and work in uh, the shields. Yeah, that's the idea. And even in Colombia, if you end up drilling in the Janos and look at the basement, uh, you'll encounter Precambrian rocks. And it's important that you know what what they tell us. Yeah, so that's the idea. So we'll have we'll have a bit of that in the second part. All right, so let's go back to uh, shear zones. So the shear zones, um, as you can see here, uh, it is a simplified block diagram, if you want. And you see here the strength, the strength of the crust, if you are uh, to look at this. And we discussed about this rheologic profile. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now it looks like something um, kind of uh, relatively uh, known to you. Uh, with the Biarritz law here, yeah, of brittle strength, and then uh, you have the plastic processes taking over, yeah, and you have the flow laws, yeah, rheologically speaking. So, of, uh, uh, as you can see, this this um, curve basically uh, correlates with the layering here, rheologically speaking. So, the brittle part of the crust and the plastic part, and a brittle plastic transition. So the localization of the formation as we go through these rheologic layers of the uh, of the crust, you can see here uh, we have the what we call folds, yeah. Whereas here in the deeper level, yeah, we have shear zones, yeah, starting from the brittle plastic transition. So the 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 localization of the formation happens into a zone, yeah. That's the idea. Now, if you look at what Fossen gives us, he says a shear zone is a tabular zone in which strain is higher than outside this zone, yeah, in the surrounding rock. Now, this is a very wide definition. So it allows us to put into this definition, into this shear zone definition, everything like folds. So where we have, you know, the, uh, the brittle deformation. But also, obviously, the shear zones, the classic shear zones, which are dominated by plastic deformation mechanisms. So when we talk about shear zones, normally when you'll be working and your colleague, your another geologist will say, well, you know, in that area, there is a shear zone. In most cases, people, when they say shear zones, they refer to the classic understanding of shear zones they refer to this type of shear zones, yeah, the, the shear zones that to our eyes appear ductile, and when we look at the mechanisms, they are plastic mechanisms. So most people, when they say shear zone, they refer to this. But here in the academic environment, I want you to, to have the wider understanding so that you, you use the terminology in a correct way. So with this definition, you know that when you say shear zone, it can, you know, it can uh, include a fault. So you can ask someone, well, what kind of shear zone are you talking about? Yeah. Now this doesn't happen because you get used to what people normally, but we have to, to basically look correctly at, at the terminology. So starting from this, um, as I already pointed out, yeah, you see here the difference, what the difference between the faults and ductile, what we call ductile shear zones, yeah? the distribution of strain yeah so the strain is very sudden in a fold yeah it, it's just this very uh, thin zone where you have most of the deformation whereas in the zone in a in a classic shear zone the deformation is distributed over a wider uh, region yeah that's the idea um now when we talk and again this i gave you on a test test number 1 and again, we are ending this section with some, maybe something very important that I want you to be left with this distinction. When we talk about ductile, yeah, the word ductile, the unfortunate word ductile, is not here to, to torture the students. It is inherited in the language, yeah, in the technical language. But ductile means that in terms of mechanism of deformation, the micro scale, it can be brittle. It can be plastic or a mix, uh, but to our eyes, when we look at the outcrop, it seems that there is no loss of continuity. Yeah, that's the idea. 
All right, let's uh, let's have a look here. For for instance, um, here it says ideal shear zone, yeah, ideal shear zone, and you see it is a computer simulation, yeah, and you you see the shear zone from here to here. Yeah? So it was a shearing here, and as you can see, the deformation is distributed, and you have here these uh, circles and ellipses, which show you where the largest the formation occurred, yeah? So here in the walls, in the walls of the shear zone, there is no deformation. And then you see increasing deformation. So here it says increasing strain and increasing strain towards the middle zone here, where you see the initial circle is really deformed into this elongated ellipse, yeah? So basically, if you were to do numerical modeling and simulate this shear zone, this is what it looks like yeah, with this grid. And you see the, the formation in the grid. Now, if you were to have a marker, which is called the passive marker, to our eyes, yeah, to our eyes in the outcrop, uh, it is continuous. Yeah? So that's why we call this a ductile shear zone, a ductile shear zone. But again, the computer now has a nice drawing. Yeah. Uh, I, I saw there was someone uh, wrote something, if you want to write it again, because I, I missed that, uh, if you ask me a question. The computer basically gives us this uh, you know, drawing, but in geology, when you look, you have to wonder yourself, if you have a marker, which is continuous, so it was deformed in a continuous manner, you have to wonder with yourself if at the microscopic level, you have brittle deformation mechanisms or plastic deformation mechanisms. Yeah, so that's uh, that's the idea. So here are, are you know perfectly ductile shear zones. Yeah, so no internal discontinuities uh, at the mesoscopic scale. So this is the most important thing I want you to remember at the scale of our vision. Yeah, without microscopes. Anyway, we call this type of deformation continuous deformation or continuous strain, yeah? Uh, so that's the idea. Now, I'm gonna give you an example, which is taken from the textbook. I think it is a brilliant example. So what do we look here? We look at the ductile shear zone. You see, you this, see this little layer, there is no loss of continuity. It continues across the shear zone. However, <laughs> Uh, actually, I think that it's not this layer. We have two layers here. This one, which goes like this, yeah? So there, there is the information. And this one, which goes like this. So actually this one corresponds to this one and this one to this one. Um, so there was more strain there. So what happens, you don't see a loss of continuity, yeah? So it seems that it, there is continuity. You see this layer here, yeah? So you, you say, well, this is not really a fault, yeah, because there is no loss of continuity. It is a shear zone. But if we were to look into this sandstone, yeah, we look into this sandstone, you see this sandstone of a very famous formation, the Navajo sandstone in uh, the United States. If you were to look at it, you'd see that the mechanism, the, the formation mechanism is brittle. It's not plastic, okay? But you use the word ductile because to our our eyes, it, there is no loss of continuity yeah, here at the level of the outcrop. So this being said, we have a little diagram, which is similar to another diagram I've shown you, but this in the context of shear zones. So look at the, uh, always when you look at the diagram, instead of say, saying, oh, what's this? I don't understand it. It's a, a very simple way to understand any diagram in any topic here on Earth, if it's such a 2D diagram, is to look at the axis, what the axis represent, yeah? So the axis here, here they show the deformation mechanism. So at the microscopic level, is it frictional or brittle or is it plastic, yeah? So this is here. And here is the appearance the appearance to our eyes in an outcrop, yeah? We call it uh, ductility, yeah? How ductile it is, yeah? It, is it non-ductile? So obviously 
we call that non-ductile, we call them brittle, yeah? Or ductile, perfectly 100% ductile, perfect continuity and so on. So you have these possibilities, non-ductile, yeah? And brittle, uh, brittle mechanism, which are the typical faults. Yeah, we talked about faults, yeah? The mechanism is brittle and they are not ductile, they are brittle. <laughs> now, you cannot have plastic mechanisms and the actual zone of deformation look brittle. You cannot have that. So that's why it says forbidden here, yeah, this field. Now, you can have 100% ductile, but the mechanism is brittle, like here, yeah? Or you can have 100% ductile, and the mechanisms are all plastic, and these are plastic shear zones, yeah? So in between, you see this situation of faults, classical faults and plastic shear zones, you have the situations in between, as you can see, semi-ductile shear zones, yeah? Brittle plastic shear zones, that, that tells you, you have a combination of brittle and plastic mechanisms, yeah? That's the idea. So I don't think it's very complicated. I think it's, uh, it, it always remember that ductile refers to how it comes to our eyes in the outcrop. All right, so one more complication and then things will become easier for the rest of the, uh, the slides. But this is from the textbook. We try to take a, the widest um, view here according to the definition, yeah? So the definition, if you remember the definition, yeah, it's a, a zone where there is uh significantly more deformation compared to the surroundings yeah so basically when we talk about shear zones and we said that shear zones include faults yeah faults as well then the faults uh what we talk kinematically what's the relative movement of the two walls yeah now shear zones you think about shear yeah you you think about shearing but you can have uh, not only simple shear, which leads to shearing like this, you can have pure shear, yeah, or the combination, yeah, sub simple shear and so on. So, this diagram from the textbook includes all these possibilities of localization of deformation, yeah. So, the simple shear case, which leads to the classical idea of a shear zone, yeah, is this one. But then you see the other end members, compaction then pure shear dilation and so on. So basically, you don't have to remember this diagram. It's just to illustrate in a graphical way what the definition says. We can call shear zones, all these zones, where there is more deformation. Doesn't matter how the, how the walls move. They move like this, they move like this, they move like this, doesn't matter. There is more deformation in that zone relative to the walls, yeah? So that's the definition. And then if you were to uh, be asked to draw all the situations, the definition encompasses, like this author of the textbook, he says, well, okay, here is a, a different way, graphical way of showing this. There's nothing complicated, actually. It's just the definition in a, in a graphical way, if you want, yeah? Just for you to remember that in general, when we talk, say shear zone, Academically speaking, you, mu you must basically be more specific. What kind of shear zone? What deformation we have there? When people talk, well, shear zones, they refer to this basically in most of the cases, yeah? All right, so now from now, uh, sit back and relax because you are gonna finish very soon. I, as I said, I'm not gonna give you too much uh, there are markers in shear zones that show us the, the sense of deformation and so on. So I kind of wondered myself, shall I put that in or not? It would be a long, a long lecture. I don't want you to be overwhelmed with this. So you'll see different representations. This is similar to the 3D diagram we had a look. Yeah, you see the rheologic profile. Yeah, uh, this is called. You see, um, basically. Uh, the sips on shorts from some offers fault model. So what the fault looks like, yeah, at different levels in the crust. And obviously what rocks are associated, uh, fault rocks, yeah, uh, with the type of deformation we have 
at different levels uh, in the crust. And obviously, as you can see, this is a frictional or brittle regime. This is the plastic regime. And we have the uh, transition here. And obviously, here you'll have the what's called the plastic shear zones. Yeah. Uh, people call them ductile. But again, ductile, you might say ductile here. It, it looks here in the transition. They look ductile, but you still have brittle deformation mechanisms combined with plastic deformation mechanisms. Yeah. So that's one way of seeing things and seeing where the different fault rocks occur. Yeah. And you will read the table showing the definition for each uh, fault rock. I think you studied them with Maria. I think so. Um, now, here, it, this, what you see here is totally equivalent to what you see here. So, so basically, uh, close this. Basically, uh, what you see here is the rheologic profile, yeah? And then what happens in terms of the shear zones, yeah? So here you see in the brittle part, we have the folds, yeah? Uh, we call them brittle fold zones. In the uh, ductile and the plastic part, yeah, the, where you have the crystal plastic processes dominating, you have the shear zones. And again, here this offers a ductile shear zone. I would definitely put here plastic shear zones from the beginning because here we don't have ductile, we don't have brittle mechanisms. Yeah, here ductile shear zones indeed because you can have brittle mechanisms in the transition zone and the, the same types of rocks yeah that's the idea all right so now uh, another diagram showing more or less the same thing so when you talk about the crustal scale uh, a crustal scale structure yeah the structure the way it manifests cutting across the whole crust yeah could be like this yeah it would manifest in a brittle way, as you can see, in a brittle way in the upper part, yeah, in the brittle part of the crust. And here you would have plastic shear zones, and you see anastomosed means that they are kind of, uh, you know, it's like uh, a com they intercut and so on, yeah. That's the idea, anastomosed. Um, and here is a transition where we have ductile shear zones, yeah. So different ways of showing the same thing. Yeah, that's why I put them here. Um, and just to look at, at a few images here, this is a very, uh, you know, small scale. You see, this is a coin, a one euro coin, and this is a granite, yeah? Uh, the, the, uh, the, as you can see, this rock has some felsic minerals, which are quartz, quartz and feldspar, and some, dark minerals, probably some uh, amphibole, um, which is a dark mineral here. Now here you can see you have a fracture and on each side of the fracture, yeah, you have some dextral, the sense of shear is this, dextral shear zone. So you see the deformation of these dark minerals, yeah, as they were entrained in the shear zone at this scale. Now, these illustrations that I'm showing you basically can make you think that across scales in geology, we have repetition of patterns, yeah? So this is a scale in independence of many things in, in geology. That's the idea. Um, now, we increased now <laughs> the field of view. You see the coin here. And basically you look here at the gneiss and th this gneiss has gneissic bending. We discussed about gneissic bending, yeah? So you see uh, uh, zones of uh, felsic minerals, which are called leucocratic. Uh, le uh, leucocratic. This is um, one word that means the white zone. Uh, and the other one would be melanocratic, yeah? Uh, that means uh, dark minerals. So. This is gneissic bending, and you see here the zone of deformation. So obviously, to our eyes, this is a ductile shear zone. 
Now, this being nice, I would expect that the mechanisms of deformation there are plastic, yeah, because it's ignized, yeah, it is in the mid crust, uh, it's in the plastic deformation zone, yeah, plastic uh, mechanism. So we can say that this is a plastic uh, shear zone because it is ignized. But when you are not very, very sure, then you, you call it ductile, yeah, because to our eyes in the outcrop, as you can see, there is no loss of cohesion. Now, the loss of cohesion, you see it here at this contact. And obviously here, this to my eyes looks like a pegmatite. And pegmatite is a, a large grain, uh, uh, dominantly felsic rock of granitic composition. It has quartz and plagioclase feldspar. Uh, and this like is- an intrusion. What... Sorry? Like an intrusion. Yes, so the, this is, uh, of course, it was pegmatitic magma that intruded here, the, the gneiss, and this is a contact. Obviously, it looks like this. All right, so this is another example. And here, finally, uh, this is something where we can see that the deformation occurred. Now you see this is a big boulder here, uh, or what is, uh, part of an outcrop, and we cannot see actually the walls of this shear zone. We see part of it, yeah? This is what's preserved. We see part of it. So everything here was deformed. But it is uh, obviously, as you look at the, at, at the text here, it says, it says budinashed quartz veins. So the, the veins, you remember, the veins are fractures. So we discussed about fractures. Now, these fractures, were filled, yeah, with uh, minerals, and uh, may, may, very often the mineral is quartz or calcite. Here is quartz, yeah. So you have the quartz veins because of the deformation in this shear zone. They were budinized, so basically you see they were more competent, more competent than the schists surrounding these uh, quartz veins. So basically they were budinized in this shear zone. And you see what it says, it's within banded magnetite quartzite. So I would say that this is probably the banded magnetite quartzite. When you say magnetite is because we, they know, we cannot see it with our eyes in this photograph, but pro probably it contains magnetite, yeah? So magnetite quartzite, this is one. And then also you have magnetite garnet biotite schist. Yeah, so probably this darker one. So you have this intercalation of schist rocks that were deformed along with them, the, the quartz veins were deformed in a shear zone. And the, the sense of shearing was, as he, as he says, top to right, top to right. And he says some secondary, he says secondary uh, shear are present. Like you see across from the shear zone, there is some deformation. So that's why he says secondary. So imagine as you learn structural geology, you go to an outcrop and you start thinking about the geological history, a preliminary sketch in your mind. You say, well, initially we had this fractures form. They were filled with fluids that precipitated the quartz. Yeah, and then the whole uh, package was deformed in a shear zone. So the quartz veins were budinized. And of course there was deformation, probably plastic deformation within these schists. Yeah, so you have to look more carefully. But I wanted to give you these illustrations, yeah? So that you get a feel uh, for these aspects. All right, so this is it. As you can see, only section 15.1, which is an introductory section with this terminology and all these things, similarly, 12.1 and 12.2, uh, just you see uh, a couple of pages here, a couple of pages here. And this table gives you the definitions of the fault rocks, yeah, like cataclysite, uh, myelonite, things like this, if you don't know uh, already what they are. So that's for you to read. In one hour, you are done with the reading uh, if you want it. So if you have questions, uh, I'm going to stop this related to the material we discussed until uh, Thursday, please let me know. 
If you don't, no worries. All I'm asking you, please, I am asking you to do two things. One is read, read the materials so that you know where to look for the information uh, you are asked to provide in the test. And secondly, during the test, between uh, 2 and uh, 3.15, yeah, I will be in WebEx. And if you have a question, if you don't understand very well what exactly you have to, to, to do in the test or whatever, come and ask me. Don't be shy. Yeah. Now, the test will have some multiple choice questions and maybe a few, maybe a few short answer questions, but they are short answer and they will be simple. I guarantee you, I, I'm not going to give you difficult questions. Yeah. So that's the idea. But please, please read the material. So, thank you to all of you who are with me. Yes, now I can talk to you, all of you. Gabriel. 14 chapter is not, uh, is not, uh, uh, we are not going to read it uh, for this section to uh, still, isn't it? Uh, chapter 14 in the textbook? Yeah. Let me see what chapter 14 is in the textbook. I have it here. So let me see. Chapter 14. Budinash. No, I'm, I well, the we discussed about shear zones. The Budinash, I've shown you examples of Budinash in different contexts. We discussed about it. Um, so that's why I, I, you know, I haven't, as you can see, Gabriel and all of you, if you look at this textbook, yeah, uh, well, we cannot put everything that's in here in half of the course. So I'm giving you the the basis, yeah, but it's a lot of material. So so if you want to read, uh, it's for your benefit. Of course, you become of course, more informed yeah. <laughs> geoscientist, <laughs> obviously, but not for the test. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give you questions uh, from uh, you know chapter 14. Okay, thank you, teacher. Yeah, so uh, to make it clear, not only for you, Gabriel, but for everyone who is here, like David and uh, Samuel and Ellen, to make it clear, all the questions have their answers in the material that we have here in the class and in the sections that I gave you to read. You will not have any question that does not find its answer in this material. That's <laughs> to make it clear, okay? So don't be afraid of this. All right, other questions? Ask me, if if not, oh, you're welcome, Gabriel. Um, if not, I'm gonna post the mechanics of the test are gonna be the same. I'm gonna post uh, the test. You are gonna download it. You are gonna do it and send it back to me. If you need, for whatever reason, if you need more time to do it, contact me, yeah? Just call me, send me a WhatsApp, yeah? Uh, come on WebEx and tell me, tell me, Bogdan, I need 10 more minutes or whatever. My well, computer doesn't work, whatever, yeah? Tell me, I mean, you know, otherwise I don't know what happened to you. Yeah, so that's the idea communicate with me and we will make it work for each of you for the particular situation you are you find in yourself in i'm giving you a, a certain time limit let's say like 2 hours or so more than the time of the class because i want you i want to force you to do it yeah because if i were to say okay here's a test bring it back to me tomorrow what you'll do some of you, not all, but some of you might say, okay, I have time. I, I'm, I'm going to do it tomorrow morning when I wake up. And then you are kind of, okay, I have only half an hour. Oh, what, what is this? What is this? Now I'm forcing you, this is a time dedicated to our class. So, you know, think about this. Then you can go and play, <laughs> whatever, do whatever you want. But uh, I want to take advantage of the time of the class to, to deal with this, yeah? Not you have our tareas. I'm pretty sure I have colleagues who give you uh, homework, tareas, projects, uh, talks, all these things. I want you to have time for those as well. 
So that's why we, we are gonna get this out of the way on Thursday uh, for you, okay? <laughs> Good. Feliz tarde a todos. Gracias, profe, igualmente. Sí, gracias, gracias, profe, gracias, sí, gracias a todos. Uh, gracias a todos. Are you okay? Are you able to follow the classes? Is your computer working or how, how do you how do you manage Alan? Obviously, you cannot hear me now. Um, I hope you are okay. If you are not and you have any questions or whatever, please don't hesitate to ask.